If you will, take your Bibles this morning and ask you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30 today. I'm so grateful for seasons of life where God reminds us that He's all we need. And if you're in that situation today, I think you could testify He's more than enough, isn't He? He's sufficient for the darkest hour that we live in. His brightness, His hope is ever shining. 1 Samuel chapter 30 today. And we're going to begin in verse number one and read down through verse six. And uh, appreciate all of you being faithful last week for our missions conference. And God worked in our hearts. Great time of study and fellowship together. Hope God broke your heart about uh, worldwide evangelization and softened it to stretching beyond where you're at to reach the world for Christ. And today we're going to resume our study looking at Hope Springs Eternal. We began this a couple of weeks ago by looking at hope in crisis and uh, looked at the uh, study, the character study, if you will, of Job for just a moment. And today we want to shift now from the man Job uh, to the man David, a man described as the man after God's own heart. In a moment that we find him in today, uh, that I hope God will stir in your heart about as well. Let's stand for a moment if you're ever able to do so out of respect for God's word. And we're going to begin in verse number one of 1 Samuel chapter number 30. And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. Verse 3. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Notice verse 4, Then David and the people that were with him visualized these men of war, lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. David's two sons were taken, or two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitist and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And our key verse this morning is found in verse 6, And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Today for a few minutes we want to look at this aspect of our relationship with God's hope. Hope in loneliness. Hope in loneliness. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the joy it is to be here today. God, I needed to hear these songs that we have just enjoyed and shared together and this special as well. The reminder, God, that you're all we need. And Lord, in moments of great despair and darkness and loneliness, that, God, you are still sufficient and able to sustain us through those moments. And we're thankful today that we have hope in the face of loneliness. I pray for each heart and life and home represented here today, especially those, Lord, who are grieving the recent loss of a loved one, possibly a dysfunctional relationship with a family member, uh, maybe just a loss of, of a relationship, God, that's just not what it used to be. I pray today that you would give to them hope. I pray for others, Lord, that, that do have vibrant relationships with a spouse or their extended family or friends, that, God, you would help them to see that ultimately those relationships pale in comparison to what you provide through Jesus Christ and your Spirit. Speak to, now to us through your Word. Convict and challenge us and encourage us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. I don't know if you share time with your family doing different things, but I find it interesting that often families tend to spend time together doing things that one or more of the family enjoy. And uh, yesterday morning, um, I don't know what your kids do on a Saturday morning if you have young kids, but they normally are not, you know, they don't come in with a holy hush into your bedroom. Father, it's Saturday morning or mother, and let me quietly ease you into your day. Usually they have plans already for the day, and they've been up for hours thinking and, and, and conspiring about what they're going to do with your Saturday that now has become their Saturday. But it's a joy. And yesterday my boys came into our, into our room to wake us up, as they always do, and uh, they both, I kind of heard some rumblings, you know, as they were talking, and, uh, and, and I was just half asleep letting my wife be mother and me be dad, you know, just snores through those things usually. And, uh, and I heard her talk, what are you guys doing? Why are you wearing that or something? Like that. So I rolled over to look at them, 
and they're in full golf gear. I don't know if you saw the pictures I posted online, but they had on glasses and uh, they had they had grabbed they have some golf clubs that Nana and Papa have bought them, but they had grabbed like a a gym bag and then Landon had some sort of like kind of just improvised bag and he had his clubs in it and they had all this gear on, they had their soccer cleats on and they wanted to go golfing with dad yesterday. So yesterday we, uh, instead the weather was a little cool during the day so I, I, I talked them down from that to just go to a driving range. So we went to a driving range, first time they've ever been to a driving range and this is just a picture I give you of yesterday. This is the three of us and you can see the, uh, the yardages in the background. I don't even, I was way back in the trees with my, no, I'm just kidding with my drive. No, I was, over, I was over here with the trees on this side driving. But the three of us enjoyed uh, a great time yesterday. Now, can I say this? What made it fun was not the shanks that I was going right and left with as I was driving. And it wasn't the other, the other aspects of the environment. It was, it was great because I was there with my boys. Now, can you imagine walking by or driving by that driving range south of Medina, and you look out and you see me taking a picture of myself, you know, by myself at a driving range? Uh, there, there's something special about shared moments. I don't know if you're like me, some of the sweetest things are some of the most insignificant things, but they're sweet because I shared it with someone else. Now, may I say this morning, often what makes us so sour and so bitter is not just what life contains, but if we're not careful, who's missing while we're going through that? My boys are at a fun stage, but there will reach a point where I wish I could go with them to a driving range. And I'm so grateful I have them in my life today. Many of you in the room today, if you're honest, there are people in your life, there are things in your life that used to be, or maybe you wish someday would be, that right now, you're kind of swinging in the wind. You're navigating life by yourself. You're dealing with a loss or loneliness. I want to encourage you today that in the season of great loneliness is one of the places where you can most sense and receive a divine hope that only God can give. And I hope today God will encourage you through our study in the example of this man, David, at a low point in his life that God gave to him great hope. Now today in our study, we want to look at two uh, different sources or uh, hopes that God gives during lonely moments of life. And I would say all of us at some point, maybe you're there today or you'll be there tomorrow, but a lonely corner that you're in that you just need a little bit of hope. And if you're there today, I hope God will encourage you through, again, our study. Number one, first of all, God gives to us hope in the midst of lonely weeping. Lonely weeping. Have you ever noticed that crying when it's shared with others sometimes can be a sweet thing. Um, maybe even grieving the loss of a, a mutual loved one. And there, there's just a, there's a specialness, there's a sweetness in that moment. But it feels different, doesn't it, when you cry alone. But when what's on your heart is not on the heart of maybe anyone else that knows you. And there are tears of fear, there are tears of grief, there are fears, tears of despair. And can I encourage today, in those moments, God still cares for you. And God still cares for me, and He comes near us in those lonely moments of weeping. Now, we're going to get to a little more in this chapter in a moment, but if you just, with your eyes, just go down to verse 16. You will notice, we'll not read it for sake of time, but the world who had just taken everything that David and his men held dear, they're holding a party. They're celebrating the plunder and the spoil and all that they've captured, and David's by himself weeping. Does it bother you that the world's having a party together sometimes and we as God's people weep alone at times? God gives to His people hope through the promises given in His Word. And I want to give you two areas in which we can receive hope in the midst of weeping that I hope God uh, will use David's example uh, to lift your spirit today. First of all, if you will, go back to verse number 3 here in 1 Samuel chapter 30. All right, so the men of David and his men, this is prior to David becoming king of Israel, and they're the vagabonds, and Saul is running them all over, and they have retreated to the land of the Philistines. And in that setting, verse 3, David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters were taken captive. Verse 5 then goes on to mention in it David's two wives as well were taken captive. Number one, first of all, you and I, through God and his provision, can receive hope for the tears we have as a result of emptiness. And specifically, first of all, number one, the pain that comes with emptiness. 
There is often a gnawing pain, just a dull pain of knowing that something that used to be in our life, in our home, in our body used to be true and now is not. And the pain of that is soothed by the presence and provision of God. They have traveled for three days. They're coming back in. And I'm sure the men had already planned what they were going to do when they got home. And as they come over the top of the hill and they look down upon the city of Ziklag and they see all that's left is smoldering debris. And at this point, they're not sure what has happened to their family members. And, and just the, the, the feeling of despair, the pain of the loss. If I were to ask you today, what has most ripped your heart out in your life, living in a sin-cursed world? I would say almost to a man and to a lady today and to a young person, we would say the greatest loss in our lives has always been a relationship. Not 50 bucks, not a loss maybe in a larger investment that we've made, not in, in maybe even a health loss that we now still deal with in our body. It's been the loss of a relationship that leaves the greatest crevice or cavern in our heart. And God offers to us in the pain of emptiness His sweet presence and hope. And I would just tell you today, in verse number 5, you see that it refers to, it almost emphasizes David's own personal loss. It refers to his two wives that David was not okay with what had just happened. And can I just encourage today, if you're not okay with being lonely, don't, don't necessarily feel bad about that. Some of the greatest men and women in church history were men and women who grappled with and struggled with seasons of loneliness. And so God gives to us hope in the midst of emptiness. Now, if you will, go, down, go back to verse number four. Notice, then David and the people that were with him, notice this, lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. What do we do when we have emptiness and God wants us to come to him? We need to, here it is, we need to pray in our season of emptiness. There is a prayer of emptiness. The scene of devastation made them all weep. David not accepted. And as men of war, they wept until they had no power left to weep. And can I say today, that's the moment when you're ready to pray. That that's the moment when now your communion and fellowship with God can go to the next level. One author said this, never allow loneliness to drive you back into the arms of someone you know you don't belong with. The devil uses our sorrow and our pain to say, hey, God failed you and you lost this and now why don't you come over here and I'll soothe you with some pleasure or some uh, immediate gratification. Our emptiness should drive us to God, not away from Him. And I just mentioned this as illustration. I don't want to get bogged down in the details of the story, but this past week there was a disgusting story in the news of the country Denmark. I don't know if you saw the story or not. Denmark is known for being what they call progressive. I would say digressive would be my term. But, but implementing new legislation to hinder people traveling from other parts of the world to have immoral relations with animals in Denmark. Bestiality is what we would call it. Do you know how dangerous it is to feel lonely and to try to fill that void with anything? may not be that, but anything other than God. The devil and the world and the flesh are having a heyday with lonely people today. Hey, come here, come with us, come fill that void with something besides God. And David had to work through this cry of his heart, who was going to hear it? Who was going to soothe? Another author I was reading said this, quote, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Loneliness can be a good thing, but only good when it draws us closer to our God. By the way, it's often this powerless feeling of loneliness that should produce in our lives prayerfulness. Nothing wrong with coming to the end of ourselves. The problem is what we do at that point. When we have no more power to weep, we have no way out. Does it draw us closer to the Lord? And I think I've said this before, but I just remind you of it. Maybe jot this down. Prayer gives us a sanctified outlet for our pain. Prayer gives us a sanctified outlet for our pain. There's nothing wrong with feeling lonely and despairing and, and worried and fearful in and of itself if it draws you closer to God. It's when we, when we go to someone else, when we try to just hold on to that, that we miss the praise and the pleasure that God can give. Psalm 40 and verse 1, David said this, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me and heard my cry. Psalm 130 verse 1, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. 
You and I must have a holy dissatisfaction with loneliness, and because of that, it enhances our prayer life before the Lord. When's the last time you've prayed about your loneliness? Feelings, fears of loneliness, feeling rejected, feeling at a distance with someone that you care for in your life that you want closer relationship with, may it be prayed over. Now, if you will, go back to our text here and look at verse 6. And notice the second aspect that God gives hope in the midst of our weeping. Verse 6, And David was greatly distressed for this. Notice this, The people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Number two, we can receive hope not just for our emptiness, but number two, here it is, for bitterness. The bitterness that often creeps into our lonely heart, God gives us hope to displace it. Um, you ever seen that, uh, some of you have younger kids or grandkids, the tear-free shampoo? Have you seen that? Well, my question is, why don't they have that for adults? Do you like the burning sensation of shampoo in your eyes as well? Well, why is it just the kids don't have to cry while they take a shower? Us mature people have to deal with that. I don't know about you, I, I would rather dry the tears and, and move beyond that, and someday we will. Revelation 21 is clear on that, isn't he? There's no more crying. But there are tears in this life, and often those tears, if we're not careful, lead to bitterness. May I give you two things this morning in this area of bitterness that prayer and relying upon God's hope can help us in. Number one, it deals with the strife, the strife that comes as a result of bitterness. And David had to deal with two aspects of bitterness in this, this verse, verse 6, that you and I have to navigate when we feel disconnected, when we feel relationally as if we're deficient. We don't have what we should have and want to have. And David had to avoid two destructive aspects of loneliness. First of all, the bitterness in the hearts of others. Um, have you ever heard the term before, the buck stops here? I don't know if you've heard that expression before. Uh, it's been around for a number of years, but Harry Truman as president, would have, he had that on his, his desk there in the Oval Office, and the buck stops here. You know, one of the problems with being a leader is if you lead in your home or in some other area of influence is often when seasons of great crisis come, you get blamed for that. Have you ever been there? That's a lonely place to be, isn't it? That was a great statement. Loneliness stalks where the buck stops. And David, as the leader, they were blaming him. Hey, how come we went and did this campaign and we left the city vulnerable and we made these decisions and it's led to where we're at? He had to deal with the bitterness of those around him. Saul had driven him from his country. The Philistines had driven him from the camp in just the previous chapter. The Amalekites have plundered and taken. And now his own men are turning on him. Men that were a bunch of criminals and vagabonds prior to meeting David, and David had taken them in and had included them, and now they're turning on him. Too often we allow the bitterness of others to further drive us away from people that God wants us to care for and love. The other day we were in a uh, restaurant uh, just north of us in Creston, uh, Lodi Crossing area, and we're sitting there, and uh, my family and I, it was a Friday night, I think, uh, a couple weeks ago, and we're just having uh, dinner there, and uh, my son, one of my sons, Landon, noticed a man by himself come into that, that establishment, that restaurant. And I was kind of getting last minute stuff, so I was away from the table when this went down, but my wife said after I got to the table, she said, Landon's concerned about this guy right here. And here Landon had watched this man by himself sit down, not pray, that was the big red flag, and began to eat his meal. And Landon was concerned that this man didn't know God because he was by himself and didn't even take time to talk to God to thank him for the meal he's about to eat. Just his mindset, how simple and yet how profound. And so we were, as a family, trying to figure out how to graciously maybe be a testimony. So I said to Landon, would you mind praying for our food? And so this man, I mean, literally, he's inches from me. My son, not in a preachy way, began to thank God for the food and thank God for being in our lives. It was a great prayer of testimony focused on that man, lonely, needing to be reminded that God was still there. You know how often in our, in our relationship with others, we're only thinking about the bitterness that we get the feelings from, the vibes from, without the need they have for the Lord. When you are lonely, don't ever make it about you. The moment you do, bitterness is around the corner. When you're lonely, make it about others, their need, 
what God's trying to do in their hearts and allow God to use you as a catalyst to draw them closer to Him. Too often we allow the bitterness of others to distract us from God's plan and God's sovereignty. Now you will notice also that not only was, were these men grieved, but the previous verse, verse 5, also talks about that David was grieved. David was grieved. It's interesting. Remember Saul was rejected from being the next king of Israel, or from being the continuing king of Israel, and then his sons. Why was he rejected? What nationality, what group of people did he not destroy like he should have? Starts with an A. The Amalekites. The very people that should have been eradicated from planet Earth were the people that were persecuting and just another goat in the side of David here in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel. And so David could have easily, who already he was running from Saul, and that's why he's in the Philistine land, and now he comes to Ziklag, and the people Saul should have dealt with are continuing. David's bitterness, he had to deal with that. It's also interesting, notice one of the wives that's mentioned in verse 5 is Abigail, the wife of Nabal. Do you remember the story of Nabal? He disrespects David, and David's going to come down and just wipe out Nabal. I don't know if you know the story there or not. And who comes and stops him from following through on his bitterness? This lady listed here in verse 5 that's now with these plundering Amalekites. And David had to grapple with, again, his tendency to get vengeance, his tendency to inflict pain upon those who had inflicted pain upon him. And as he worked through his own bitterness and his own heart, he now begins to turn toward the Lord. See, a crisis does not make a person. It shows what a person is made of. David wept just like his men wept. He sorrowed just like his men sorrowed. But he did something different with his grief and therefore avoided the bitterness that could come. May I ask you before we move on to go to Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to show you the connection between bitterness or the lack thereof and how it affects our horizontal relationships with those that we have in our lives. Hebrews chapter 12, and if you would please, verse number 11. Hebrews 12 and verse number 11. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. The writer of Hebrews says this, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, notice, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Skip down to verse 14. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 15. Look diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Notice, and thereby many be defiled. Here it is. Peace, relational peace, and bitterness will never be a part of the same relationship. They are oil and water. They are the antithesis of one another. And can I ask you a question today? If I were to ask you today, is bitterness the result or the cause of loneliness, how would you respond to that? I think if we're honest today, typically we would tend to say, well, if I had to choose between the two, bitterness is the result of loneliness. But may I submit to you today as well, bitterness is the cause it's the cause also of loneliness. Bitterness, let me love on you today for a moment, is antisocial. You like being around bitter people? I don't. I don't like being around myself when I'm bitter. And it is often our reaction to other failures in relationships that lead to bitterness and making assumptions and carrying it into the next conversation or relationship that leads to further loneliness. And this cycle develops and bitterness left in our hearts did you see the verse? We either have peace with God and with man, or we have bitterness and we defile everything and everyone we touch. And David had to work through that in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And the, the deadliness and the threat of bitterness was something he wanted not to be a part of his life. Instead of putting your hope in what others think of you and how you feel about them, put your hope in God. And I love in verse 14, he says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Focus on the Lord, who someday will remove all loneliness and all bitterness, and He will reconcile all things to Himself. And so there is this dealing, this dealing with the strife in our own hearts and our relationship with others of bitterness. Now go back to our text in 1 Samuel 30, and notice the end of verse 6, what David does with the bitterness of others and what could have developed 
and metastasized into his own bitterness as well. Look, if you will, at the end of verse number 6. But in response to this, notice 1 Samuel 30, the end of verse, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Number two, not only does God help us deal with the strife of bitterness, he warns us of it and helps us guard against it, but number two, he gives us the solution. He gives us a solution. The other day I saw a picture somebody sent me. It was a, a, a flowery card, like a Hallmark card. It looked like a beautiful card, and it was going to say something sappy or sweet. And, and it had uh, the following statement on the front. It said this, roses are red, violets are blue. All right, that's on the outside, all flowery and pink. You open it up, and on the inside it said this, if I had a brick, I would throw it at you. <laughs> I don't know if a brick is involved in your dealing with bitterness, but you know how often we're just as dysfunctional and just as detrimental to relationships with how we respond to bitterness? David could have done a lot of things. Start building protective walls, dialoguing with the men, trying to t- talk them down in some way. But his focus was upon the Lord. His focus was on receiving encouragement from God alone. He was alone, driven from the people of God, hunted by Saul, and now his own men are turning upon him. And what does he do? He turns to the Lord. Notice the little word encourage that's found there in verse 6. David encouraged himself in the Lord. It's fascinating that that word encouraged has two sides of a coin, if you will. It can mean something really good, and it also often in scriptures translate in a way that is means something bad. Here in this verse, in verse number six, encouraged himself in the Lord carries with excuse me carries with the idea of growing strong or growing resolute. You're, you're strengthened. What's interesting is in other places in context it carries with it the idea of growing hard or calloused. Have you noticed that? I've noticed lonely people tend to become hardened people with just flesh involved and just humanity involved. And instead of strengthened and encouraged in the Lord, hardness begins to creep in. And so we need the Lord's help in this. We need deliverance from that. And God gives the solution as we draw our encouragement from Him. Psalm 56.3, David says this, What time I am afraid, I will trust in Thee. David was at his wit's end, but he was not at his face end. He was continuing to depend upon the Lord. One article I was reading made a statement recently I thought was so good. Here's what the author said, quote, In our extremity, God is still available. What I love about God is this. No matter how crazy it gets, no matter how far out my life may feel like it's moving, God is still there in that moment. Everyone else can peel off and give up and bail out, right, Brother James? But God is still faithful. And this morning, wherever you're at, no matter how far anyone else may be, God is there in that moment. Draw your hope from Him. Derive from Him the peace and comfort that pushes back against the bitterness. When you're feeling most lonely, look upward. Look to God for eternal hope. All right, now if you will, let's spend a few minutes in a second corner, if you will, that sometimes we huddle down in and feel so lonely that God wants to give us hope. Number two, God gives us, lo- gives us hope in the midst of lonely weakness. Lonely weakness. Go, if you will, now to verse number 7. And David said to Abiathar the priest, to Himelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And we'll talk about what this is in just a moment. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? Number two, God gives to us hope in the midst of lonely weakness. I heard the other day someone said math, M-A-T-H, to them, and I would nod my head in agreement to this, said this, math stands for, quote, mental abuse of humans, or two humans, M-A-T-H. I don't know if you like math or not, but can I tell you, when you add up everyone in your life that's of significance, that can offer anything to help your life, and all you come to is one, that feels real strong, doesn't it? Doesn't. There's a vulnerability when I add up everybody and everything in my life and I still come up with one. It's just me. And the lonely weakness, the the moments of I don't know how to go forward, I don't know where to go, is when we most need to focus upon the Lord. One of the greatest challenges of loneliness is feeling weak, feeling vulnerable. Notice a few things that God gives us in those seasons and those times where we feel that. Number one, He gives us hope in the area of discernment. He gives us hope in the area of discernment. First of all, number one, you notice there in verse number seven, there was a pursuit of discernment. 
There was a pursuit of discernment. You may have had someone in your life in the past. I know for us men, one of the things that I'm not looking forward to, I've talked to many men that when they lose their father, that that life just feels different from that moment forward. I'm thankful for my father and the guidance and influence and just the point of reference he is on even simple things. But when you lose those people and now the spouse or the dad or the mom or a grandparent or someone else in their life that used to be that, that direction and that beacon, when they're gone, now there's a sense of law. Where do I go? How do I go? David's thinking, I've lost everything. God, where do I go? How do I go forward? And so it, it clarified where he was going and who he was following in this season of lonely weakness. And so we need to pursue discernment in seasons of loneliness. I have noticed this, and I just caution you today. Some of the dumbest things ever done by the greatest Christians in history were done in moments of loneliness without the Lord there. When you're lonely, you're vulnerable. When I'm lonely, I'll tend to make the wrong decision on my own. We need God in those moments. Don't you? I do. God's presence in our lives and Him give, being the one who guides us and leads us. And so David inquires of the Lord here. He uses the ephod, which basically was priest, uh, Aaron's priest-like garment, and on it were the Urim and the Thummim, which we don't have time to get into that today. It's real fun to say fast. But there were these stones and they would light up in a certain sequence and God would use them to answer yes or no or give direction through the ministry of the high priest. And so David now is using God as the point of reference instead of his own leading and wisdom. Now, we don't have time to look at it, but just food for thought. If you go back to chapter 29 of 1 Samuel, I don't know that God is leading David in chapter 29. He's dialoguing with the Philistines. He's debating whether he's going to join their army as they fight against even some of it's the Israelites. And it almost feels like for a moment, David's kind of gone sideways and now he's doing his own thing. But isn't it interesting to hear in chapter 30, when everything falls out from underneath of him, he remembers who's to be in charge. And he turns back to God for discernment, for direction that only God can give. I think we have time to look at it. Would you real quickly go to the book of Job? And I, I want to kind of dovetail our study last week with this week. Job 23 and verse number 8. When you're in a season of loneliness, you need direction. And I would submit to you, the only one who should be directing you is not your emotions or someone else's, but it should be the Lord. And Job touches on this in chapter 23 as he grapples with his own bitterness described in verse 2 and his wandering and dealing with all that's happened to him. But notice if you will, verse number 8. Job 23 and verse number 8. Behold, he says this, I go forward, but he is not there, referring to God, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, and I cannot behold him, he hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot, notice now his response to that truth that he's, gra that he's grabbed onto. My foot had held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more, more than my necessary food. And so in the, in the seasons of loneliness and despair, and you don't know which way to go, God is the one that we're to listen to. He's the one we're to follow. If you're in a season today or you look back on your life to seasons of loneliness, isn't it amazing how quickly this comes closed and dust begins to gather and the Word of God ceases to be the direction in our life? We tend to separate from that which could most help us. If you feel lost today and you feel lonely today, may I encourage you to return to His words, esteem them, value them of great significance. So there's a pursuit of discernment. The hopeful response to being lost in isolation is to return to the Lord. It'll let him direct our lives and our steps. All right, now back in our text in 1 Samuel 30, look at verse 8. And notice what David does as he now refixes his life upon God and the discernment he can give. David asks, shall I pursue after the troop? Verse 8, shall I overtake them? Notice God answers, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Number two, there is not only the pursuit of discernment that David exhibits, but the promise that God gives. The promise that God gives. Probably you saw it in the news this weekend, but the, the earthquake that occurred in Nepal um, and affected some of the other border countries that are there. 
as of Saturday morning when I first saw the story, I believe it happened early, uh, late night for us on Friday, um, there were seven, 800 folks that, that were fatalities and many more injured. And as of this morning, it was over 2,000. The number just keeps growing. Just a sad situation. We have missionary friends over there that have begun to get a little bit of vibe from as they're navigating it, trying to figure it out. But one of the most amazing things about the story was while that happened, I don't know if you know the topography of that region, but there's a pretty big mountain there uh, that maybe you've heard of. And it's called Mount Everest, and there were actually several climbers on the mountain that were scaling it, as often happens this time of the year, when the earthquakes occurred. And it didn't shake the mountain, per se, in the sense that altered the mountain, but what it did is it cut loose a bunch of snow, and there were avalanches of rock and snow, and, and many of those people right now still have yet to be found. Their families are desperately, many of them U.S. families, trying to figure out where they're at and what's going on their status. And I will tell you today, it doesn't look good for them. You know what's striking about this story is that God promises David, you will recover all. In fact, if you go on down the story, we won't read it for sake of time, but verse 17, or verse 18 and verse 19, verse 18, and David recovered all. And verse 19, the end of verse, and David recovered all. And so God promised him, you're going to recover. And can I just remind you, we may lose things in this life, but we're not lost. <laughs> we, we recover all. Body, soul, and spirit are redeemed and reconciled, and we stand with God, never to be alone again. There, there's a promise there, but we have to seek God, and we have to lean and press in upon Him to receive that promise and to live in light of it. We don't have time to look at it, but in chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, which is just two chapters removed from this, it, you, well, let's look at it real quick. 2 Samuel chapter 1, look at verse number 1. 2 Samuel 1 and verse 1. This is right on the heels of what we're studying in chapter 30. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites. All right, this puts us right into chapter 30 of 1 Samuel. And David had abode, notice, two days in Ziklag, and it came to pass on the third day he gets news that Saul has been killed. How close David was to the throne. He had no clue in chapter 30. And three days later, he's finding out God is setting in motion, him taking over as the king. I just find it interesting, at our darkest moments is often when we're the closest to God fulfilling his promises. Are you worried about this world? Are you worried about all the rumors and crises and catastrophes? All that means is we're closer to the promises being fulfilled. There's hope in that. And God has promised that. We must live in light of that as we navigate the dark moments, the lonely moments that we may find ourselves ourselves in today. Someone has said this, being positive in a negative situation is not naive. It's leadership. And David was a leader here. David saw the future and God was willing to trust God with the future and willing to interpret the current data with that which was to come. And because of that, God sustained him through these moments of weakness. Weak discernment should draw us closer to the Lord. All right, now let's spend a few minutes in the balance of this chapter. A couple other verses. Go down to verse number 9. All right, so he gets the promise. Notice now what he does in verse number 9. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. Notice now verse 10. But David pursued, he and the 400 men, notice this, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint they could not go over the brook Bezor. Number two, and I'm thankful God gives this to us, not only does he give us hope for our own discernment, also hope for our own partnership. Weak partners, people that fail us, people that are too weak to help us through this season of difficulty. And David, as he watches these men peel off in their, their weakness, he perseveres, he moves forward with hope. There was an article um, the other day talking about the top uh, uh, tourist uh, islands in the world, the top rated islands to go to. And there were several. The only U.S. one was uh, Maui uh, in Hawaii. There was also an island called Roatan in Honduras. My wife and I have been on that island. But it's amazing to me how islands appeal to people. And the reason they appeal to people is because maybe they're kind of isolated, but at least I get away from those people I don't want in my life. You have that? Not only do you suffer from loneliness, the only people you have in your life you wish weren't in your life. Amen? Does anybody else agree with that? And, and so there's, there's a tendency to then isolate. And David is with men. Think about this. They just wanted to stone him. And now as he gets the promise and God's leading again, they, they just 
They got nothing left in the tank. I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying in the moment, he couldn't lean on those 200 men. And often it's the weakness of others around us that compounds the, the loneliness and despair that we feel. They failed us. They forgot us. They've forgotten us. God reminds us that in the midst of that, God is still with us. Now notice two things very quickly as we finish. Number one, he helps us in the midst of others who faint. Those who faint, those who stop. And this is just something I'll give you a side note very quickly. I notice there's a cycle of loneliness that often is in my own life, and I see it in others as well. And here's what it is. We have high expectations of what others are going to do for us and be for us, and they disappoint us, and we pull back. We go to someone else and some other relationship, and we have expectations of them. We don't know why we have them, but we do. And they're going to be the be-all, the end-all be end for us. And then they don't live up to what we expected. And we get more disappointed. And the cycleness produces an ever-increasing loneliness. And David could have done that in this situation, given up on these men or in some way retaliated against them. Instead, he followed the Lord and followed the Lord with those who also were willing to follow with him is often the loss or separation from a human relationship, listen to me, that reminds us ultimately our reliance must be upon God alone. I'm thankful when others fail me from a standpoint that it can strengthen me spiritually that God has to ultimately be who I'm depending upon. For some of you, it's not your doctor. For some of you, it's not your spouse. For some of you, it's not some deliverer, Messiah that's going to come someday. It's God as it always should be. And we rely upon him in those seasons of loneliness. And David kept his eye on the Lord. As men quit and as men failed and as men could do no more, he kept his eyes upon the Lord. Now lastly, let's spend just a couple minutes in these last couple verses in chapter 30. Go, back, go down, if you would, to verse 21. I don't have time to break all these verses down, but just notice a couple of them. Verse 21, and David came, all right? He's recovered everything. And David excuse me, came to the 200 men which were so faint they could not follow David, uh, whom they had made also to abide the brook Bezor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial, of those that went with David and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil. Basically, they failed. They let us down in a moment of weakness. And so they have no part in the, the victory and the triumph and, and the spoil that we have secured. And it's interesting to me that David, we don't have time to read it, he says, uh, no, we're not going to do that. Just because of their weakness or maybe even a legitimate reason that they could not stay with us in the fight, they still are worthy of sharing in the victory and the spoils that God has provided. And I have found this, this to be true. What we do in seasons of loneliness defines whether we will be an effective leader or not. I found that to be so true. If you go back to verse 13, they pick up a young Amalekite, and notice the contrast between the Amalekite's leaders and David as a leader. David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me. Notice, because three days ago I fell sick. That, that's, what, that's what most people do in season of loan. We've got to cut any free weight, any, any freeloaders, anyone who's not contributing to the cause. And David said, No. My focus, my hope is in the Lord, and I'm not going to take it out on those who are following and supporting me. And so David responded rightly so, and as a result, his leadership grew in the ranks of these men as well as the nation of Israel. Can I ask you today, would you focus a little less on those who've been unfaithful to you? Spend a little more time focusing on where you can be more faithful to those you have left in your life? I know many of you have been in churches, you've had your heart ripped out. Some of you had family situations I can't even begin to comprehend. But what are you doing with the people God's put in your life today? Is there bitterness? Is there, is there a defense mechanism in place? Or is there a sweet, open connectedness and service and consistency toward those God has put in your life? Faithfulness to those God has left, the remnant He's allowed in your life. As we finish today, would you go back to the book of Psalms, and let's read quickly just a few words from the lips of David in another lonely moment that he shared, and I hope later you'll meditate on these verses. But this may be your heart cry today, and I hope you'll end where David ends in Psalm 142 and verse number 1. Psalm 142 and verse 1. <clears throat> 
as you're turning there, there was a great uh, video clip I saw this last week. I don't know if you've seen some of the unveils where military servicemen or women will come home and surprise their families. I love, I love those. Just especially, um, there was one a few weeks ago I saw of some dad that got surprised at a hockey game. I don't know if you saw it or not, but he just, literally, he just tackled his son and his son tackled him and grown men, you know, just weeping and laughing, all the emotions all at once. But there was a really neat one this last week of a little boy um, who was sitting at his, his school picture. Um, and he's sitting down, you know, and you got the little photographer guy and they got this little backdrop and the teacher's coaching them on what to do and how to position. And at the last minute, the kid didn't realize that he's all positioned. His dad slipped in behind him. And the photographer took the picture and then as sometimes they'll do, you know, just to engage the kids, they'll show them on the camera the picture. And it was awesome to see this little boy. I mean, he's like maybe six or seven and he, the, the, the photographer turns the, the lens to him he leans over a look and he kind of, and then he like does a double take and he leans in and the photographer is just kind of acting like no big deal. And finally he turns around and there's his dad right there. And just, it was kind of a moment of shot and then crying and hugging and all of that. And he went to get his family picture or his, his uh, school picture. He left with his dad. He hadn't seen for over a year. It was a really cool video. Can I remind you today that if you'll zoom out the lens just a little bit, there's a big picture. And that big picture, if you're a believer today, is your father. God. Maybe it seems like he's kind of in a crevice or he's off to the side in some way, but I'm telling you, he's there. And with him, he has hope he's trying to give you today. Now look at these verses in Psalm 142 and catch the, the struggle and then the hope that David arrives at. By the way, you notice the, the, the heading on it. He's, he's in a cave, right? He's in a corner as he writes these words. I cried in the Lord with my voice, with my voice, and the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. All right, he's honest with God. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed with me, in me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they privily laid a snare for me. I, lo I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry. For I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. And in that interesting, it ends with God bringing him out. But do you notice that? The, what will compass him? The righteous. He goes from a lonely cave to God bringing him out, establishing him as a king, putting him in a place with lots of people, lots of relationships. God wants to do the same for us. I was reading a, a poem the other day, and there was a simple statement in it that I thought was, was applicable today. The author said, the poet said this, we were given two hands to hold, two legs to walk, two eyes to see, two ears to listen. But why only one heart? He surmised because the other was given to someone else for us to find. And today you may have one heart, and it may feel pretty lonely by yourself. But can I remind you, there's a God trying to even use that loneliness today to draw closer to you and to reveal himself more fully. The question as we finish today is this, will you allow God to come near to the dark corner of your lonely weeping, your lonely weakness, and give to you lasting, vibrant, bright hope? Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you for the great joy it is to preach this study today. And Lord, know that it's not just...